Okay, welcome back to another installment of Ask Eddie and Anne with, hey. <laughs> I understand that's Emily this there. This is Emily the today. Backside we can see on the couch. Uh, Anne, I'm going to admit right off the bat, I'm dragging a little bit. Um, it was uh, it was great seeing you in person at the TCM Classic Film Festival, which we both just attended, and I'm still kind of recuperating from. Did you have a good time? I had a great time as always. Yeah, I had uh, I always stay with an old friend from high school, and he'd moved houses and had a pool, so I was able to swim every morning <laughs> that I was in LA, which was fantastic. And a nice change for me and yeah i saw a bunch of friends i've made over the years in la and saw some good movies so yeah it, it, good time fantastic well you know the game changer for for kathleen and i is that we got to bring tizzy with us to the hotel so that was that was pretty great because uh you know she can be a handful and uh, the fact that she got to stay with us at the hotel that was a big as, as much fun as i had uh you know as one of the hosts of the fest tizzy had more fun because she got to have her first airplane trip she got to stay in uh, the hollywood roosevelt hotel um you know and uh, my good friend lee langford kind of babysat cat sat for her on a few occasions so kathleen and i could do the party circuit and then uh and then she had a nice drive back with us in the car uh that was her longest road trip ever and she actually dined with us in two restaurants on the way <laughs> i don't know if the uh if they were aware that a cat was dining in their establishment but we managed to sneak her in so that was that was pretty good, and then and then to cap it all off, Anne, I just have to share this with you. This doesn't happen to me too often anymore, but I went out today to the uh, to the antique fair, and usually, you know, I don't even look for any movie related stuff at the antique fair because it's all gone. You know, not nothing's left. If you're have any luck at all finding anybody that has movie memorabilia it's been picked over a million times and there's nothing any good left and it's just you know movies you know grade c movies that you've never heard of but um today there was a guy who had a bin of uh lobby cards and posters and i started half-heartedly like thumbing through them and then it was a score I realized like, oh my gosh, this guy actually has some stuff in here. And you know, you have to be very cool, you know, when, when there's no price on them. And uh, so I pulled out some things and I pretended that I didn't even know what they were. And uh, like, how, how much are you asking for these things here? And the guy was like, $5 each. And I got, um, I got this uh, very nice lobby card from wow. the Oxbow incident with both Henry Fonda and Dana Andrews on the card, which you don't actually see very often. So that that was a score. Lady in the Lake. Oh, and I love that particular lobby card because yeah. it's the world's most miserable Christmas party. Exactly. And you get a beautiful shot of Audrey and Leon Ames. In that picture i actually already had that lobby card but, but this was this is what was amazing so i realized that um there was this beautiful and it's an incredibly good shape this lobby card from the man i love with ida lapino and bruce bennett but behind it the guy didn't even realize he had sometimes packed two cards in one envelope behind it was a lobby card from stranger on the third floor oh wow it's pretty great uh, yeah. i mean that's that's you know that five dollars each right good job then he says okay hang on this is this is what's great then there was uh the breaking point cool Beautiful card from the breaking point 
And on the flip side, in the same envelope, on the flip side was this really nice card from Body and Soul. Wow. Which, yeah, very good. Then a title card. You rarely see the title cards, but a title card from Mystery Street. Very nice. And I would a movie I've been thinking a lot about lately. This beautiful card from the Crimson Kimono with both uh, Glenn Corbett and James Shigeta, oh. with the uh, with the drawing of the geisha. This very intense lobby card of Eli Wallach and Robert Keith from the lineup. And then my my best, and this is what was so funny. Not often do you see a lobby card from In a Lonely Place, uh, right? Oh and gosh. I went up to the guy and said, how much for these? He goes, oh, five bucks each. Now, honestly, you can't, you can't get this lobby card. All of them put together, you can't get this lobby card for, for that price. But what was so funny was the guy at the end said, you know, they're not really well-known movies. And he picked on this card and he said, who's even heard of this movie in a lonely place? And I said, after I paid him, I said, well, it is my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, and, and enjoy that then. And I think I left him perhaps worried that he had sold those for a little less than he could have gotten. But I'm happy that I was there to... Uh, I can't believe you so, got an in, the, in a lonely place lobby card for five dollars. That's insane. It's, and the crimson it's kind of it's kind of amazing, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, that was a good deal. That was a good day. Okay, I'm gonna get my my earpiece. I'm gonna hide this here behind my head so it's not so distracting. I also got this jacket. Yeah. Oh, so you got this the jacket the same place? Yeah, I like that jacket. Oh, there's a there's a lovely woman who who makes custom made shirts and jackets, and she goes to this antique fair all the time, and it's the only place she sells. She she makes everything out of found material, and then makes these very style. I mean, people have seen me kind of wearing other variations on this, you know, before, but it's it's just super nice, and it's got this um, hang on, it's got this gorgeous lining Ooh, in it. It's really nice. nice. So yeah, I. Uh, I like to bring her business and it's very, and that's my Pogues. People who may not know the boys, the boys from the County hell. Uh, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the Pogues. So, okay. <laughs> enough, enough preamble. Should we, uh, should we, should get, we get rolling here? Yeah. Okay. okay. And this one is from Randy. In previous editions of Ask Eddie, you teased an article that Chris D is writing for North City Magazine in which he compares film noir to punk music. Any updates on which issue it'll be featured in? Very interested to read it, although early country music always seemed to me to be the more apt comparison, mostly due to its down and out lyrics. Thoughts? Thoughts? <laughs> uh, Chris's uh, article will be uh, not in the issue that's coming out very soon, which is the one that has William Holden on the cover, uh, but the issue after that. And Chris, if you're listening, I apologize for it taking a while to get the article up. Uh, we, we try to balance things out in terms of the length of these things. And Michael uh, Cronenberg was really excited about doing the layout for Chris's article because he he wanted to do it graphically in a, a style that befits the punk rock movement and kind of combine that with film noir so and, and I the article is fantastic um, it's a it's a bit of a memoir because uh, if, if people don't know Chris was uh, the songwriter and uh, singer for the flesh eaters and also for a wonderful band called divine horseman in los angeles and chris has been a buddy of mine for many many years uh because he also worked at the american cinematheque so when i first started uh doing stuff at the cinematheque uh that that's when i got to know chris and i and at one point i said i feel like i recognize you somehow and then he said, have you ever seen the Flesh Eaters or Divine Horsemen? And I said, that's where I know you. Um, 
so yes, that will be very soon, and I'm very much looking forward to it because it's a beautiful uh, memoir about his uh, uh, his youth in becoming a film fan, and then how that segued into his love for music and right into the LA punk rock scene. Um, and and it's it's a great article, and it will be coming up shortly. I hope that's a thing. Okay. Um, and for the you... second part of that, so uh, about country music always well, seems to me to be the more apt comparison to noir. I, I, I get where that's coming from uh, because so much of country music is, you know, uh, storytelling. You know, this this is how everything fell apart for me yeah. <laughs> in, in, uh, in storytelling form with music uh tr true enough and i feel like that that's uh definitely the case with older country music i have uh i don't quite hear it in modern country music maybe it's there i just don't follow it that closely um but there are uh, you know and and then there's all those hybrids where you don't know what what it is really I mean, there's a guy uh, out of Texas named Robert Earl Keane that I really love because he's a, you know, he's from Texas. And, you know, he's a little later than the whole Flatlanders thing with, uh, you know, Butch Hancock and Joe Ely and those guys who I, I really love. Uh, he came a little later than that, but he wrote a song called The Road Goes On Forever that Joe Ely yeah. did a cover of that is like a classic noir song, you yeah. know? Guy meets a woman in a pool hall. They take off, you know, he gets involved in some shady shenanigans. There, you know, there's a whole drug deal thing gone wrong. And it's like a classic noir story done in like three minutes and 30 seconds. And I absolutely love it. I don't know whose version I like better, Robert O'Keen's or Joe Ely's, because they, Ely did a great cover of it, which is heavy electric guitars yeah. and, is much more of a rock and roll version of the song than than Robert Earl Keane's, which is more of country folk. But anyway, um, how, how about your feelings? Are you do you have favorite country yeah. noir? Yeah, I mean, uh, Porter Wagner did an album called Rubber Room, and like there are so many. That is like well, there's Rubber Room, which is basically about how this guy wound up in in a mental institution, and then there's also this great song where this uh, guy actually finds out his wife's having an affair. So like, it's, 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 so like he goes and he confronts him and kills him. Like it's a really intense song. So that, that, that whole album is like really intense. And of course, Johnny Cash, like the long well, black veil and yes. cocaine and cocaine blues, which is actually a cover. Um, and then I would say uh, um, Towns' song, uh, Marie, which is probably the single most depressing song ever written. Uh -huh. It's beautiful because it's about uh, a homeless man and his pregnant girlfriend, Marie, and yeah. it will break your heart. Um, so, yeah, I think there's definitely um, it's definitely a lot of country noir because so much of it's about, like, you know, affairs and being down and well, out. Well, the cheating, the cheating, the cheating thing, thing is a big deal in country yeah. music. Yeah. And, I, and we did a we did a feature on Johnny Cash in the Noir City magazine. Yeah. Uh, years ago, I think Jake Hinkson wrote that, if I'm not mistaken. And, oh. uh, you know, The Man in Black. And uh, there was a very, a, a very noir lifestyle, but also much of the stuff that he sang about, especially, you know, when he got in his later life, when he did that whole album of murder ballads. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, yeah. uh, that was pretty intense. So... Uh, I don't know that we're going to do a, a country noir thing in the magazine beyond the Johnny Cash thing. But if uh, Randy, if you got any ideas, let us know. Yeah. And also just put a quick plug in for uh, Nick Cave's Murder Ballads album, which is yeah. also really incredible. Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. You uh, number question two. two? I'm yeah. going to do that. A few months ago, Eddie started to give his opinion of Robert Benton's 1977 noir, The Late Show. But he got sidetracked on another subject and never got back to the original question. So what are your... Oh, 
<laughs> says Doug in Silver Springs. Well, my initial, my immediate take on the Late Show is, I wish they had shown it at the TCM yeah. Film Festival because they just had Lily Tomlin as a guest and they did her hand and footprint ceremony. And it would have been wonderful if they had shown the Late Show as one of the movies for her at that festival. I don't, I don't know why they couldn't. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, Doug. Uh, it has been a number of years since I have seen The Late Show. And I remember um, seeing it when it came out. You know, Art Carney and um, what's, the, what's the fella's name? Uh, I'm con it's Bill Macy, right? Or what's the guy's name that played Maud's husband on television? Oh God, he's such a good actor. Um, but it's so funny because yeah. is it is it Bill Macy? I honestly or is do not that, remember. Because I'm thinking also of William H. Macy, who is you know synonymous with Mammoth and all that yeah. stuff. But wasn't it Bill? Oh, it's embarrassing that I can't remember the guys because he has a prominent role in the film. But you know, it, it was very interesting in that mid '70s thing there was such a such a period for people paying tribute to the classic detective stories because um you know besides the long goodbye and uh you know the dick richards farewell my lovely and the great chinatown i mean uh the late show kind of slid in there as the first of several of those that robert benton did right he yeah. also did twilight um, and he did um, his Hitchcock film in the still of the night with Roy Scheider and Meryl Streep, which I just watched again recently and was a little disappointed by, uh, uh, to be honest. Um, but that was a whole period of, of these these guys paying tribute, you know, to the to the old school. And Art Carney is my recollection is that Art Carney was was really great in that film. Yeah, I mean, I saw it like in the early 90s, so I'm like trying to go back and remember. I used to remember really liking the chemistry between R. Carney and Lee Tomlin, and that that really made the film work because just their back and forth was really great. That's what, yeah. so that's what I remember. I honestly can't remember what actually happens in the story. It's been so long since I've seen it. I mean, it would, it would be great to resurrect that film and get it some airplay, you know, either on TCM or at the festival i'm surprised i'm a little surprised they didn't show it at tcm but you know only there's a reason for that something that we don't know about so anyway uh i i'm looking at the the questions and i just wanted everybody to be absolutely clear i have not seen these questions before this moment yes because <laughs> as, as you know you just sent them to me today and i was yes. out all day and i just walked in the door like 15 minutes ago so um, so yeah, this is a long question. You get to do the honors. Of, I get to of, do the honors, and I tried to trim this down, but it was really hard to do. Um, so this is from Martin, Los Angeles. Uh, while it's always good to watch the major leading men of noir dealing with dames and hoodlums, to my mind, the roles generally lacked a few of the elements of noir that make it such a compelling genre. Fear, doubt, weakness, dread, desperation, can be found in other leading men's performances, uh, Hodiak and Somewhere in the Night, Dure and Chicago Calling. Roles uh, like that help serve, serve a more fleshed out noir story, more novelistic characterizations um, than the escapism and wish fulfillment of the male leads of Out of the Past and On Dangerous Ground and others. I think fear, doubt, weakness, dread, and desperation in those movies are instead portrayed in roles other than the lead male protagonists. What are your thoughts? Um, I would say that I, I don't know that I entirely agree with that observation because I think that um, when you're young and you watch these movies, I think the men in noir, um, you know, being for role model or an example of male behavior. You can't help when you're watching Bogart or Robert Mitchum, um, somebody like that, 
you can't help but admire their coolness and their stoicism, you know, John Garfield. Um, but then as you get older and you watch the characters, you realize that, especially in their noir films, that that is kind of, they've adopted this persona as like a suit of armor. And they're really not all that, you know, certainly, uh, you know, Bogart in The Big Sleep and in The Maltese Falcon is very different than Bogart in, in A Lonely Place. Um, and, and some of the 50s noirs where he's much more vulnerable. Uh, also, I, I would say that Robert Ryan in On Dangerous Ground is all of those things that, uh, you know, he's fearful, he has doubts, there's a weakness in him because he's, you know, I think that the the violence stems from a fear and a weakness in the character that, you know, he, he isn't very strong in dealing with how wicked the world is and he lashes back. And uh, that's a sign of weakness as, as Ida Lupino recognizes in the movie, you know. Um, so I do think that a lot of these characters, I mean, it's hard to, to look at Mitchum and see him as being weak in any of those roles, but he is a total chump in a lot of those, you know, yeah. how he just falls for the woman and, you know, an angel face, he's, he's a chump. Yeah. You know, completely. He, he is, he is not a strong character. He's totally weak. He, he cannot stand up to Gene Simmons in that movie. And eventually he pays the price for it, you know? And, and I know a lot of people will watch these and say, oh, you know, it was a tragic accident. But in a way, I just feel like that guy just, just walked right into his own demise. If he yeah. couldn't see the, the warning signs a mile away, uh, you know, he could he could have stuck with Mona Freeman and lived another 30 or 40 years. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but it, it's an interesting observation. Um, but I think that in many cases, these stoic, taciturn leading men are are much more desperate and fearful characters than they appear to be on the surface. I'm thinking of like Dana Andrews and virtually everything he played. If you look at like where the sidewalk ends, yeah, he's a tight-lipped, tough guy, but he's he's terror-stricken underneath it all. You know that he's going to end up being like his dad, and he doesn't want to have that on his conscience. You know, and, um, yeah, co complicated. It's a complicated thing, but I, I do think that's one of the essential things about noir is that the the leading men are not really that heroic in film noir they're they're working through some big issues yeah. you want you want to just move on to the next one yeah okay steve in minneapolis wants to know which small performances in noir pictures from the 40s and 50s do we find most indelible and he says, to qualify, it has to be a part too small for a supporting actor nomination. I don't know that there is such a thing. Yeah. Uh, but he's talking about ostensibly incidental players who do something so striking, you can't forget them. So he's saying Mary Astor in Act of Violence right off the bat, right. and Paul Kelly in Crossfire, Dorothy Adams in Lady Gangster, and Richard Boone in The Garment Jungle. Richard Boone is always indelible. Um, and Mary Astor, I mean, to my mind, that is a that is like a perfect supporting actress role, as is Paul Kelly in Crossfire. But I mean, neither of them were nominated as far as I know. But um, but I, I get what you're saying. So do you have any off the top of your head, Anne, that... Um, yeah, I think one that just popped, I think it popped in my head because we just screened it at north city in oakland though was sam jaffe in um in the accused in the accused thank you where he plays the kind of weird um 
like he's the medical examiner medical and, and, examiner yeah a forensic yeah. guy yeah it is just such <laughs> an incredible like he just that is a, that i think is the most memorable performance in that film not yeah. that the, the lead isn't great she's wonderful of course um but he's just like yeah his character is just so kind of weird yes he lights up that whole movie yeah um i i mean you know, I, I don't want to get hung up on like, is this too big a role to, you know, like if you get more than one scene, does that mean that you're now a supporting actor? Because I'm thinking of Hope Emerson in Cry of the City is, God, is, yeah. you know, <laughs> is incredibly memorable, but it really isn't a very big role at all. Um, there's also, is it... Um, is it Joyce McKenzie who has a, a one scene in Somewhere in the Night um, where she plays a woman kind of gone mad? And, oh, and God does. Like that one scene is the best thing in the movie. She's the best thing in the movie. Uh, so in, in its own way, it's sort of like Paul Kelly's scene in Crossfire yeah. uh, where you're. it's like, wow, what is what is this all about, you know? Um, cause I would, I would point to Paul Kelly as being one of the, that scene is one of my favorite inexplicable scenes in film noir. I also, I guess Percy Helton in Wicked Woman, is that too big a role? I mean, it is probably a little bigger. Than, it's a bigger role. A Certainly role. for him, for him, yeah. it's a bigger role, but you know, I, I just have to give a shout out to Percy Helton because he's so indelible every time he. He walks on screen. Okay, so I'll say Percy Helton and Kiss Me Deadly, where he huh. just has the one scene where Ralph Meeker, you know, slams his hand in the in the desk drawer. Of course, Elijah Cook and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Just en endless bit parts that he had. And Whit Bissell is another one. Like he's great in uh, He Walked by Night. Whit Bissell has like a bigger role than he usually gets because he's usually just a a bartender or, or you know a, a desk clerk or something but he has a much he has a role in he walked by night and he's he's really really good in it um so yeah i'm sure i'm sure people are going to weigh in with their many many examples i mean it's funny i could practice you probably pick a movie and i'd say oh my god you know this person is great in that film although they're only on screen you know, for mere moments, but yeah. Uh, well, and but, I always love the masseuse in in a lonely in, in a lonely place. That's like one yes. of my favorites. Um, uh, my gosh, uh, uh, I'm embarrassed. Her name is escaping me right now. But she was actually uh, that character is based on an actual uh, woman in Hollywood. Um, God. Colleen Gray told me all about her, that there, there was a masseuse in Hollywood that everybody called up. She was, I think, Rogers, I think it was Will Rogers' sister, who who would like, as Colleen, would just beat the weight off you. She was like masseuse to the stars, and she would come in and just beat the hell out of the actresses and um anyway i remember when i saw that film and then said is that the character being played by this woman in in a lonely place and she said oh absolutely i'm embarrassed that i can't remember her name right now it's in it's in dark city dames anyway um am i going i'm going I you're think. going i'm going uh this is from martin in the netherlands uh yes i know your show is not called request a, a restoration but any chance of release of the Kid Glove Killer in early Zinnemann short, maybe in combination with other crime does not pay shorts. Also, could you possibly discuss what happened to Slattery's Hurricane by Andrew Detoff with Richard Ridmark and Veronica Lake? Any chance of this getting out of limbo and on a disc? Okay. Um, Martin, I hate to tell you this, but the issues with these films is that they are they are owned by major studios. Kid Glove Killer was uh, was an MGM picture, unless I'm mistaken, and I don't believe I am. Uh, now I believe under the control of uh, 
a company called Park Circus that has all those older MGM films. Although it might, it might, I might be wrong about that. It could be held by Warner Brothers, but whichever way it is, them. So the idea of a restoration being done by an outside source is is highly unlikely. It would have to be done by the studio themselves. Um, Slattery's Hurricane is 20th Century Fox, so that is now owned by Disney. And whether or not Disney, this registers on Disney, uh, who knows? Uh, I do know that years ago when my good buddy Sean Belston was still running the archive at Fox, we had talked about the possibility of restoring Slattery's Hurricane because um, I know they changed the ending of the film for general release, but I believed we might be able to find Dato's original end, which was much more downbeat uh, and, and kind of depressing. Uh, and we looked for it, and even though we found a copy of the film with one additional reel, and I said, this has got to be De Toth's original ending, uh, that turned out to not be the case, unfortunately. Um, so I don't know what, what Fox will do with that movie. Uh, it's a very, very underrated film. I, I have shown it. And I squeezed it into a noir festival because it had Widmark and it was Detoth and Buzz Bizarities, uh wrote the the final screenplay and Linda Darnell is in it and Veronica Lake is in it. Uh, so it's a it's a very very interesting film, but I I can't quite call it noir. Uh, did you see it when I showed it? At the I Castro? did. It was a really good movie. I really yeah, it, liked it a lot, and I thought it was a kind of a good portrayal of addiction with um, Veronica Lake's character, and yes. um, it's it's a very like adult film, like a grown up film. That's what I liked about it was well, and and Fox was did that quite a bit, but it just it just it was one of those things where it felt very much like you know even though there was sort of actiony element to it with you know. Well, it was a big hurricane. With the big hur hurricane, yeah. But it was much more focused on the characters and their interactions with each other. It was a good movie. It reminds me a little bit of um, Night in the City in that, you know, that's full-on film noir. But Widmark made Slattery's Hurricane around the same time. And it seemed that Fox was doing this thing with him where People loved seeing him as these kind of reprehensible characters. But I know Widmark didn't particularly like playing that role. So they would, these were movies about reprehensible people who had found redemption at the end of the film. Even though in Night in the City, it's like the ultimate sacrifice that leads to his quote unquote redemption. You know, it's not. It's not like he gets to enjoy it at the end. But Slattery's Hurricane was kind of the same deal where he's he's kind of a louse through the whole movie mm -hmm. and he and he's rotten to two women and then and then he has his his big ending where he has to go up into the hurricane in his plane. Um and you know, he, he's kind of heroic at the end, uh way the ending of the film. Um but that, that was something they started to do with Widmark to balance it between him being this scuzzy sleazeball that everybody loved to watch on screen and then making him, inching him towards being a leading man by having him behave somewhat heroically at, at the end. He's certainly not heroic in Night in the City, but he does in the end make a a heroic gesture at the end of the film that uh, that makes his miserable life somehow, uh, if not worthwhile, at least marginally redeemed. Uh, okay, um, Paul Newton, Paul Newton in Crescent City, California, wants to know if we're familiar 
with the last film Marsha Hunt appeared in in 2008 called Empire State Building Murders. Uh, he wants to know, is this a film noir parody? Where can I view this film? Can I stream it or buy DVD? Help, he implores. <laughs> um, have you seen this movie, Ann? I have not seen this movie. It's weird. It's a, it's a very strange film that I was somehow involved in in the early stages. Uh, I'll, I'll make this brief. Uh, Jerome Charon wrote the screenplay for it. I, at the moment, I can't remember who directed it. It's a somewhat well-known documentary filmmaker. It, it is a French production, even though neither, of, neither the writer or director are French. Um, the idea behind this was, was very odd because they contacted me and said, we know that you have relationships with a lot of these old Hollywood actors. Could you put us in touch with them because we want to interview them for a film we're making, right? And they, I think they wanted to talk to Dick Erdman and Marsha Hunt and I think Rhonda Fleming and I, I honestly can't remember all of them, but Kirk Douglas was one that they, they got to play a, a major role in the film. And, and this was after Kirk's stroke. Uh, and he doesn't really do anything in the movie. He, he is photographed listening to a lot of old recordings and things. Anyway, what ended up happening, I'll make a long story somewhat shorter. It became apparent to Marsha and Dick and, and me that they weren't asking for interviews. And this was a little bit of a, a hustle. They were, they had preset questions, but then in the middle of interviewing these people, they started feeding them lines, like handing them script in the middle of what was an interview. Can you read this? And I realized when Marcia called me and said, Eddie, that, that was odd. It wasn't really an interview. They started asking me to do dialogue, mm -hmm. which, which is dicey because that's acting. Mm -hmm. That's not agreeing to give an interview. That's actually acting, which you have to pay people for, mm -hmm. especially in Marsha Hunt's case, given that she was a charter member of the Screen Actors Guild way back in the 1930s, it's like this for free. Yeah. But what they were doing was they were trying to build a mystery plot around existing footage mm -hmm. of all of these people in these old movies. Glove Killer was one of the movies that they actually pulled footage of Marsha. And they had all this old footage of Kirk Douglas and footage of Richard Erdman. And then they were cutting it together and then using these new interviews as like the way Warren Beatty did in Reds, where everybody's talking about their younger life and all of this stuff that happened around a murder that took place in the Empire State Building. And it was weird. And I don't think they ever completely resolved the issue of, which I brought up, which was like, you, you got to pay these people, right? They're, they're not going to read lines. They'll answer questions. That's an interview. But if you hand them lines to read, that's something else entirely. So that may be part of the reason that this film, I have seen it. It was shown in St. Louis and I saw it with Marcia and she was kind of, struggling to make heads or tails out of it because it was very, it was ingenious, but it was very convoluted. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's all I can say. Um, and I don't have the slightest idea, Paul, uh, where you can view the film or whether you can stream it or not. I just, I just don't know. Cause I'm not sure that producers ever worked out, uh, adequate payment. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, Kirk Douglas is a major movie star. I don't care yeah. if he had a stroke or not. I mean, he is a major movie star. And, you know, after his stroke, I think Kirk was like, 
somebody wants me to be in a movie, I'll do it. Yeah. But then it's like, Kirk, this is acting. You know, make sure they pay you. Not like he, you know, he doesn't need to hear that from me. I mean, he's, I'm sure he still has an agent. Anyway, no. that was, that was what that was all about. All right. Okay. Uh, I see that Angels with Dirty Faces was recently restored after it was out of circulation due to legal disputes. I'd like to nominate Angels with Dirty Faces for, pres for preservation with the National Film Registry. I want to have a full understanding of any legal restrictions that uh, may still be in effect. And this is from Joe and from Wooster. Um, I, I don't know that uh, Angels with Dirty Faces is not in the National Film Registry. It may, it may very well be. I, I have to advise people that being a film listed in the National Film Registry does not necessarily mean that there is a perfect restored copy of the film in existence. They, they don't necessarily go hand in hand. I mean, you know, Double Indemnity was put on the National Film Registry probably 20 or 25 years ago, and there was no good copy of the film, really. And it has since been restored, and now, you know, it's coming out in a 4K ultra high definition release from Criterion, which I hope is good. Sometimes ultra HD, you've heard my take yeah. on that before. It's like- It doesn't you're necessarily not, go in the classic film. No, you're not doing the film any favors. Uh, but then you see Sunset Boulevard in ultra HD and it looks fantastic. And yeah. Treasure of Sierra Madre looks amazing. Uh, so it could be great, but it doesn't necessarily follow. So I, I would, I don't know what the status is of Angels with Dirty Faces, but I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it, if it, if it's not on the registry, that it will soon be on the registry. Um, okay. Um, Joe in Berkeley sent in, this is you, you wrote this, so I'm reading My commentary, yeah. Yes, Joe and Berkeley sent in three thought-provoking questions, so we're splitting them up over the course of our next couple of broadcasts. A, from Joe and Berkeley, what makes San Francisco so special to noir? Could you each name a few qualities about the city that appeal so dramatically uh, to noir and, and contrast that with Los Angeles? Um, and do you want to do you want to field that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the reason why San Francisco is Noir City um, is one, I think Chinatown is part of that because it gives like something that can be very exotic. And of course, San Francisco is not that far from Los Angeles. So it's a great place to go for like something different from just shooting in LA. So I think Chinatown is part of that. Um, I think part of it is, I don't know, it's hard to explain. Like there's, you know, San Francisco was always from a sort of inception was always somewhere that people went to that was sort of lawless. I mean, you, you had the gold rush and the Barbary Coast. And so I think that's an aspect to, to of it. And, you know, I just think there is something sort of enclosed about it too. You know, I mean, like if you look at, um, it's very claustrophobic. It, yeah, despite yeah. the despite the beautiful views, it's a very claustrophobic city because it's surrounded by water on three, on three sides. sides and, yeah, um, which leads to this sense of entrapment in a way that escape is not as easy. In L.A., you just get on any freeway and you just keep driving. Yeah. Not not so easy in San Francisco, you know, uh, and the and the weather varies quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you can get three different types of weather in San Francisco on the same day. Yeah. Um, you know, the fog is yeah. very mysterious, um, and and I I just think the sense you get the same thing that you get in New York, which is the sense of it's an urban environment with people kind of living on top of each other mm -hmm. but it's a it's very 
picturesque because unlike New York where you have to get up in a blimp or something to get that super shot of Manhattan, you can kind of get that in San Francisco any which way you look because you know, if you're on Twin Peaks looking any direction, it's spectacular. If you're in Marin looking back at the city, if you're in the East Bay looking at the city, there's all well, these yeah. spectacular views and, and you know. Yeah, and there's also like, it's really funny because if you go up Knob Hill, you know, one of the things you can see really clearly from there is Alcatraz. So you can, from the richest neighborhood in San Francisco, you can see the prison. The prison <laughs> out the windows, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, and there's absolutely. Alcatraz. I mean, I think that's another more aspect is Alcatraz itself, too. It's just right yeah. out there in the bay. Yeah. And and also, um, on a more thematic, less a geographic thing, and a more thematic aspect is that San Francisco has always been a place where people come to change themselves. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, very much an artist community. And people, at least they used to come here to be bohemians, to find their true self, uh, to adopt a new identity. Uh, you know, I mean, geez, Oscar Wilde was saying that, you know, over a hundred years ago. Um, so that, that to me has always been very significant. It's different now. City feels a little different now because I think people still come here to change themselves but because of the tech boom it's like they're coming here to to make money mm -hmm. and, and and that's a very different thing they used to come here to be artists and now they come here to get into tech and to make it make a ton of money which has really really changed the dynamics of the city mm -hmm. uh very much not not for the better in my estimation but um, you know, I think that's it. And you touched on it very succinctly at the top when you said that in Hollywood, they would, um, you know, you look at a film like Woman on the Run, that was originally going to be shot in New Orleans. But they said, we don't have that much money to go on location in New Orleans. So they said, well, we'll get, we can get everything we want in San Francisco. And it's just an overnight truck ride away. So, you know, whenever they whenever they made a film, uh, when Hollywood made a film in San Francisco, it was always load up the trucks and drive overnight and start shooting within a day. You were up and shooting, you know, House on Telegraph Hill, Dark Passage, Born to Kill, Woman on the Run. All these films were made uh, like on a weekend pass to San Francisco from L.A. And, and the films had a totally different feel because of the geography of the city. Okay, uh, where are, we? oh, so also PS, is there a new edition of Eddie's Dame's book coming out? Uh, not on the schedule right now, but that will happen. That will happen. <clears throat> uh, how were, how big were the, this is from Linda, how big were the noir films at the box office with the original showings? Were they received well, like Arsenic and Old Lace or Sullivan's Travels? Basically, how do they fare against the comedies? Um, I don't know that there were any huge hits. Um, I mean, they, they were successful because, um, uh, noir didn't cost as much to make. So the profit, uh, you know, the, the net profit on those films was, was generally pretty good. Double Indemnity was a hit. The Maltese Falcon was a hit. Um, Postman Always Rings Twice was a hit. Mildred Pierce was a hit. Those are three James M. Cain stories right there. Uh, Gilda was a hit, although um, I think it was in the top 10 in 1946, along with Postman Always Rings Twice. But, you know, it. Um, Linda says, you know, compared to the comedies, uh, it's a surprise to go back and look at what were the big movies, you know, um, The Bachelor and the Bobby Soxer, um, uh, Going My Way, 
you know, the year of Double Indemnity going my way was the biggest grossing film. The year of Gilda and Postman Always Rings Twice. The Abominable Song of the South, which can't even be screened anymore. Yeah. That was that was by far the biggest hit, Disney's Song of the South, which, I mean, you can, I'm glad TCM keeps showing Gone with the Wind, but they, there's no way they can show Song of the South. That's yeah. just like, nope, that is over and done. That, that ain't getting shown again. So, in, you know, th those films were the big hits. Family Fair and, and G-rated movies m made the most amount of money back then, by, by far. And then it was really something for, you know, these other films to sneak in. But honestly, it wasn't that they were box office gold. It's that they kept the studios. They made money for the studios because they didn't cost much to make. That, mm -hmm. that was kind of the secret. Okay. okay. Uh, me okay. now. You know. Um, uh, Alan Rossi in San Anselmo says, uh, the new version of Nightmare Alley had a color version and a black and white version put out with the director's approval. Have you guys ever heard of that being done before? Um, do you know of any films? Well, yeah, weirdly, in? they did it with a Zack Snyder cut of a, of a superhero film recently, where I think they released like a, like a different version of it. Like, I, th I think he got fired and they brought in another director and read that and then when they did his showed his version then they did it in black and white i don't really follow comic book movies but i did yeah. see people discussing that so i guess they did that recently with the, with the i think it was one of the, the new superman films yeah i don't um comment i don't think if you guys know by the way more about that Zack snyder thing i was just talking about feel free to comment on it you know, on yeah, Facebook I'd like to know. Or, I I yeah. don't, um, you know, I don't recall this ever happening with an older film. Yeah. In more recent times, um, now that you mention it, I seem to recall something like that. I don't I don't know the details, but I have to say, uh, Fox really tried everything with Nightmare Alley. They really did, uh, but. You know, they, they really did, did everything that Guillermo del Toro could have wanted them to do to make that film a hit. Huh. And it just wasn't, it wasn't going to happen. You know, it yeah. was, it was still COVID time came out in December of 2021 and people still were not comfortable going back to the theaters and I'm I'm amazed that they it wasn't just like in one city that they actually did it in multiple cities where they they did a black and white version. But um, most of the time it's just directors saying I really want to release this in black and white. You know, uh, the Coen Brothers, of course, did uh, the Man Who Wasn't There in black and white, and uh, Ed Wood. Ed Wood was in black and white, and obviously, you know, a film like Roma. Yeah. that was in black and white, looked fabulous. Um, you know, the artist was in black yeah. and white, that kind of stuff. But uh, two versions, I don't, I don't, I don't know. That those We may have hit on the only two I know of. Oh. Yeah, my brother, it's so funny too, this came up because my brother and I, my brother called me today. Actually, it's weird. I talked to my sister this morning and then one of my brothers called me and we, and he, he asked me about Nightmare Alley because he just thought Kate Blanchett was amazing in it. He was so impressed with her in that film. Because she's so, you know, I think we mentioned this before. I mean, she is so uh, courageous in playing it like it was 1947 that she was going to vamp it up and be like a classic femme fatale and I, I just thought it was great. And I didn't, I didn't understand people who, who didn't get what she was doing and didn't like the performance or kind of stupidly said, that was very unrealistic for a woman who's a psychotherapist to have an office that grandiose and to have 
wardrobe like that. And it's like, well, I understand this isn't like Berkeley, California, it's psychotherapy. This is a movie version. This is a, you know. Well, it's also a woman that's wants wealthy clients and is blackmailing them. Trust me, if, yeah. if I was going to a therapist in Manhattan that was charging me $500, their office is going to look to different than the therapist I actually see. <laughs> and, it's all, and it's also, I don't like it when people make criticisms like that because it shows they're not thinking it through. Like, obviously, if she looked and acted like a normal therapist, what interest would she hold for Stan Carlyle? Yeah. Right? He would dismiss her out of hand. But the fact that she was wealthy and had this incredible style and she was, you know, this beautiful blonde with the red lips and everything, it's like, okay, here's a challenge. I'm, I'm going to take this woman on toe-to-toe. And yeah. with, without that whole showbiz thing that she was working as well, none of that would have been believable. I mean, if she played it like a normal therapist, you wouldn't believe it for a second that Stan is like interested in her for any reason whatsoever. So people have to put a little more thought into their criticisms of these things. Just like, I didn't buy it. It's like, well, you know, too bad. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. it's nice people are really nitpicky too. I, I know, I know. I mean, if you don't like it, you don't like it. I get that. But if you're going to, you know, a movie can just rub you the wrong way. There are certain movies like that that, you know, people love. Well, you know, I was not a big fan of uh, his previous movie, The Shape of Water. I didn't, I didn't like The Shape of Water at all, honestly. I just... I just couldn't get myself to see it, which is weird because he's one of my favorite directors, but I just wasn't interested. And I am now sort of Michael Shannon. I just don't want to see him playing another bad guy. He's a great actor. I want to see him in good roles. I've seen, yeah, him, I want, on, I I've want seen to... him on Broadway. I mean, he's then this is like my thing. Like I, I adore uh, the Danish actor, Moss Mikkelsen. I literally will not watch his American films. Because... You don't need to see him playing a villain anymore. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's done. It's like, I mean, because yes. he's, He's a great. They're they're both great, complicated actors. I don't want to see him in these these. Even though they, but you know, they do. A, they're good actors. They're always going to give a good performance. It doesn't mean I have to sit through a crap film to see them. <laughs> have you seen um, the missing person? The missing person. Which the, it, which one's that? It's a Michael Shannon movie that he made years ago. It's a it's a uh, post nine eleven movie. It's a it's a detective story. And it's a very different role for Michael Shannon. He he's the protagonist. Uh, it, it's like a classic noir character where you're not quite sure what's off with this guy. Yeah. But he's not a villain, and he's yeah. not he's not malevolent, or he doesn't terrorize anybody. Uh, and it's a really really good role for him. And it's a movie that I I'm very fond of. I like that film a lot because I was I waiting like what's is anybody going to do a noir that sort of deals with 9-11? And, and this was, uh, among the films that have tried that, this was my favorite, The Missing yeah. Person. Uh, there's, it's a cool movie because there are clues about what's eating this guy through the whole movie, and they're, and they're just very cleverly dispersed. It's, um, it's a good film, very well written. Okay. Um, who, whose turn is it here? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I was so interested in what you were saying about that movie and wondering where I could uh, get it that I lost I, track. I'm sure, I'm sure you no. can stream it. You must yeah. be able to stream it. No, I'll look, I'll look it up. Uh, so this is from Carrie. Why are actors instructed to leave doors open when they enter and leave? They walk away and leave car doors open on the street. They leave doors open when they enter from the oh. outside and on the way out. Is this a tip? type of method for acting and directing <laughs> um i i have no idea uh do you know what carrie is referring to yeah i mean she's right so when you, typically in a film when someone enters a the room they don't close the door behind them just like people never say goodbye when they end a conversation on the phone in a movie either 
And well, keep now your it's... hands out of your pockets. <laughs> um, I I get like with I guess I, I I I honestly haven't noticed this that much. I think this is like the second question we've had. No, the other one was why do people exit cars from the passenger enter and exit right. from the passenger side? Yeah. So this is kind of the same deal. So uh I guess if maybe the world was a safer place one time, I could see if you're leaving a car and and you're in a hurry, it might help the scene if you just leave the door open. Yeah. If you're jumping out of a car because it shows it's a way of showing urgency. Yeah. Like I'm not even pausing to close the car door. As for doors and things, I mean, if they're inside, why would you close the door? But if you're coming into the home from outside, I don't know. I mean, I'd, I'm going to be watching for it now, but it seems to me that people close the door. I'm also also very conscious of this thing in a movie. Man enters room, door opens, you hear door open. Man like swings door, but camera stays on man and you're waiting for the sound of the door closing, which happens quite a bit because then they just, he's not really closing the door, uh, but they put the sound in later yeah. because very often in movies, they don't want the sound of the door closing to mess up the track. So it's like just gesture that you're closing the door and we'll put the sound of the door closing in later. You never see the door actually closing. To me, that's like the typical way it's done in a movie, right? A lot of times you see, now I'm gonna be co the contrarian here, Carrie, and say a lot of times you see people go into rooms and the closing of the door is like a thing where it they close it right in the camera. Yeah. Because they yeah. want the screen to go dark and then they cut to something else on the other side of the door or something. Um, so I've seen that many, many times where it's like just close the door right into the camera. Um, so we'll see. Now I'm going to be on the lookout for this. Thank you, Carrie, for completely ruining the next five or six films I'm going to watch because I'm just going to be watching for the opening and closing of doors instead of following the plot. But uh, it's not as easy to execute as you might think in a movie because these are the things that everybody has to always think of, like the sound of the door closing. Does the light change if there was a light coming in from outside and you close the door? Right it changes the light inside the room. Maybe you want the door to stay open because the light's better if the door is open. You know, there, there's just a million decisions. Well, there's not a million. There's like many decisions that go into every action that's made in a movie, more than just this is what you'd normally do. And, and that's why movies are movies <laughs> and not real life. Okay. okay. Um, this is from our good pal Michael in Post Falls, Idaho. It wouldn't be an Ask Eddie and Ann without a question from Michael. He manages to get one in every time. Okay. Uh, I saw Eddie's Noir Alley, um, well, Noir or Not on TCM featuring Cotton Comes to Harlem. And uh, Michael had just read Chester Himes' The Real Cool Killers. And he understands why Eddie gave the film a reluctant thumbs up as noir. Uh, Gravedigger Jones and Coffin Ed Johnson characters are not the edgy, hard-boiled detectives of Himes's books, but are played with humor. Yes, um, Raymond St. Jacques in Godfrey Cambridge. After reading, um, after uh, I watched A Rage in Harlem which Bill Duke directed based on another Himes book. Again, Gravedigger and Coffin Ed are played for humor. Um, he liked how Chester Himes tackled social reality between the races 
in a tough detective story, but he'd love to see a movie which accurately captures the feel of Himes's books. Um, I, I agree. Uh, if Eddie could have produced a film of a Himes novel, who would he have play Gravedigger and Coffin Ed? Well, it kind of all depends on when it's being made, you know? Yeah. I mean, back in the day when Chester Himes was still alive, uh, you know, I'd cast Harry Belafonte. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if Sidney Poitier would have been exactly right. Uh, maybe James Edwards and Harry Belafonte or something. I could see James Edwards definitely playing the uh, coffin head. Um, uh, anyway, uh, well, I see Michael picks Denzel Washington and Mike, well, Michael K. Williams would have been perfect. Unfortunately, he passed away. So, uh, and he says with Carl Franklin director, and that's <laughs> and Carl uh, Franklin would be my pick for director too. Uh, yes, although, I mean, yes, you, that would be appropriate. Although I can, there's a lot of people who can do a good job with that. Carl obviously is is one of them. Um, I I have to say. Uh, Ernest Dickerson, who I just met at the TCM Festival, uh, you know, he's directed a lot of films on his own, including Juice, which is a really great, uh, great film, his first movie. But he shot all of Spike Lee's early movies. Mm -hmm. And man, does that guy know his his stuff? Because we introduced the third man together and he just he, he knew that film inside and out and was just a huge noir fan. And um, anyway, just saying, he could do it too. Um, yeah, that's that's good. It would be nice to see those, but you know, they should have made a series out of uh, the Easy Rollins books, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, Walter yeah. Mosley's. You know, because Devil in a Blue Dress was clearly a setup for more of those, and Denzel, you know, was at the peak of his. He still is, you know, at the peak of his game, but. Uh, his star power was just off the charts in that movie. Yeah. And and unfortunately, nobody could see it. it. That movie was way ahead of its time. Yeah, I mean, I saw it actually the same day as I saw Seven. And um, I, I just thought Devil in a Blue Dress was such a great film. And it's so funny because I didn't like Seven anyway. I have a, a lot of problems with that film. But then on top of that, I just had so much resentment that everybody was talking about that and was not talking about, not Devil, in talking about Devil in a Blue Dress because yeah. I thought Devil in a Blue Dress was so was so brilliant. And yeah, I thought for sure you just see it and think this would be great for a series of films like, like with Denzel Washington playing this really intriguing character. But that that film is so great and it, and it's just so much about. I mean, it's about L.A. too. I mean, in that sense, it's really a character in the story, but also just the stuff about race in it, too, in this really integrated totally. way where they're not doing it like as I'm saying this, like with the Candyman requel, there is a little too much forward on that as opposed to where you're just really integrating into the story really smoothly and you're understanding it from because it's just part of the story and you're seeing that as, as part of the reality uh, well, Carl, Carl did a Carl did a very beautiful thing in that film, and w which Walter Mosley had done with the book, which was basically saying nobody has ever done this from a black perspective. So he basically, right from the beginning, he sort of flipped "Farewell, My Lovely," and turned it. You know, where, where the book starts with Marlowe going into you know a quote unquote colored bar yeah in the you know in the black part of los angeles and he completely flips that because that's the bar where easy hangs out and it's like a white guy comes in looking to hire him to be the private eye which is yeah. brilliant and and carl was so his direction is so good in that hey. movie Sorry. that um they didn't have to oversell the the point of the film, the race thing. It's there in every frame of the film. It's it's abundantly clear, especially to people who are familiar with the material. Like I've seen this scene a million times, but now I'm seeing it flipped 
Yeah. Because the detective is black. Because there's a scene when the cops roused him in yeah. his house, which you've seen a million times where they bust in on Marlo and the cops juke him up and, you know, and you see it again with a black detective and there's a whole edge to that scene that is unbelievable because you realize they actually can just kill this guy and get away with it. Yeah. You know, that they, they could plant a gun or whatever. I mean, the, the terror that Denzel Washington conveys in that scene and the anger he has at these guys just thinking they can walk into his home mm -hmm. is, uh, is something that you just, was beyond anything you felt in a normal detective story. And, uh, and that's why I think that movie is so, so good and, and special and should have been a whole series of films, but Hey, what are you going to do? <clears throat> Carl, I wish I could make that happen for you, but <laughs> I can't. Okay. So you ready for our indie noir not? Uh, I guess so. We'll see. We'll see how I do. Uh, the first one is, I'm going to mispronounce. Uh, uh, Lambitius. 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 Uh, do I even know this movie? I don't know. It's, it's, it was, it was sounded interesting. It was like an, it was Australian production, but it had like American actors in it. And I, I haven't seen it. Yeah, I had not seen it either, but it sounded in intriguing. Okay, so whoever asked that one, congratulations. Thoroughly stumped because I have not seen the movie. So I am i can't answer. Okay, Night of the Demon. Uh, Night of the Demon is a, is a horror movie. It's, yeah. a, a, it's not a film noir. Dana Andrews and Peggy Cummins are in it. Jacques Tenour directed it. Cy Enfield actually wrote it. Not too many people know that, but um, but no, it's a it's a horror movie. Uh, Joel uh, Cohen's Tragedy of Macbeth, and this is a current one on, with Denzel yeah. Washington and Francis McDormand. There's Denzel again, and proving Francis. proving that he is still in his prime. Uh, I have not seen it. Oh. I know that people are nuts for the cinematography and the direction of the film, but. Uh, th there are certainly noirish aspects to Macbeth. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a very noir story. It really it is. is. A, it is a very, very noir story. So I'm not, you know, Shakespeare, it's like, it's the same thing with people saying, you know, is Alfred Hitchcock film noir? I mean, Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs> not Shakespeare to, not Shakespeare. to compare Shakespeare and Alfred Hitchcock, <laughs> but Shakespeare is his own thing. And yeah. the fact that Shakespeare wrote like, you know, most of the plots you're going to find in modern fiction, uh, he's already done them in some way or another. Uh, you could basically claim everything, whether it's a comedy of manners or a romance or a noir, whatever. I mean, it's Shakespeare. So, yeah. Well, and he, and he had, I mean, the, the reality is, you know, he, his tragedies are just that tragedies and, Noirs are tragedies in the sense that you have a highly flawed character Precisely. whose own hubris typically brings them down. I mean, they're very, noirs are very kind of classic stories that way. I, I completely agree. So um, I sometimes question the, the necessity of spreading the noir net so wide that it loses. Uh, you know, like when you start considering Shakespeare as noir, I mean, it's good to see the elements that the noirish elements in these other things, but I think you can go too far in calling it a, a noir. Yeah. You know, yeah. even though sometimes people have made a noir and taken it, the story from classic literature sure. and stuff too, like, um, yeah, so The Devil, 1921, with George Arliss. This was a silent film I had not seen. Nor have I. I have not seen it either. I mean, you could have asked me a couple dozen silent films that I would have said, yeah, that, I definitely feel that's kind of a noir. But The Devil, I have not seen yet. So uh, that's going on my list. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now Voyager 
which is my favorite, both my favorite romance, romantic film of all time. And Claude Rains plays the world's greatest psychotherapist. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, but, but noir, I say no. I say, I say no. That's uh, a romantic melodrama. And, uh, yeah. and I, I don't, I no. I'm going to, I'm going to draw the line there. Okay. And Little Foxes. As I'm, as I'm drawing the line on Little Foxes, kind of a, you know, a, a, you know, it's a family drama no. kind of thing. I, I don't, again, I mean, Pandurier is in it. Yeah. <laughs> and he's uh, great. It's a great performance. It's he's, the he's great, but I, but he I'm done not, it on stage. Uh, yeah, he had done it on stage, yeah. but I, I, don't I don't see that as a as a noir no yeah no. and all about Eve uh, I understand why somebody could stretch that uh, but if Ann Baxter shot Margot Channing <laughs> I might be tempted to call it a noir film or if she poisoned her or something yeah. uh, it's just a backstage drama. Yeah. A, a, a very witty backstage drama, just an awesome film. Yeah, uh, but um, but I don't I don't. That's just a show business thing where everybody's backstabbing and you know everybody's awful to everybody else. But um, you know I'm thinking uh, in, in the theater, a double life is more of a noir. Yeah. Um, the Velvet Touch oh, yeah. with Rosalind yeah. Russell is completely a, a noir because she kills her producer yeah. and then uh, tries to hide hide this from the authorities, played by Sydney Greenstreet. Wow, how great is, is that? Um, you know, th those are the... Even I Wake Up Screaming is kind of a show business noir, yeah. but um, you'll notice that, you know, that was the last chapter, the new final chapter of Dark City, The Lost World of Film Noir, was called The Stage Door and was all about noir and show business. And I very consciously left All About Eve out because I don't I don't really think it's a film noir. You know the film that in a way to me, and it's not, but in a, in a way it's very film noir to me more than even All About Eve and some of the other ones is Letter to Three Wives. Yeah. To me, really feels like a, a noir, be, part because so much mm -hmm. of it's told in flashback, and um, and also in the sense that even though no one's getting killed, the act of this woman running off with one of their husbands, which is the premise of the film, right? She's right. got this letter to say, is would destroy that woman's life because it's not just that it's her husband; it's also you know her economic <laughs> position in life and everything else. It was a you know lives were kind of. And the woman's doing it in a very capricious way, too. Right. I mean, she really, this unknown, this unseen woman who writes this letter is really a femme fatale that's like threatening, you know, these three marriages. It's, but, it's, but I still don't think it's a film noir, but I'm saying to me, that's yeah. one of the ones out of those types of film, to me, that's really the closest to a noir, both in structure and also in, in sort of the characters. It's very interesting that uh, Joe Mankiewicz, you know, uh, came to prominence during the whole noir era mm -hmm. at Fox. And he made a couple of films. I mean, Somewhere in the Night is clearly a film noir. Yeah. House of Strangers is less so, but still I would show it on Noir Alley uh, um, because it has, you know, that that's almost a Shakespearean uh, drama uh with the three sons trying to determine how they're going to carry on from the father who created this dynasty and then has lost his power uh but i i feel that at fox mankowitz um understood what was going on with the noir movement mm -hmm. and while it had an effect on him he quite consciously stayed away from those types of stories because he wanted to be an A-list director. Yeah. And he did not want to make crime movies mm -hmm. because that would pigeonhole him as a genre filmmaker. 
and he was letter to three wives and all about Eve and the barefoot Contessa. And he, you know, all of these have certain noir elements in them, but he never got pigeonholed as a genre director the way some other equally talented directors. But he was a writer, you know, he's a yeah. writer director like Billy Wilder. And I mean, the difference between the two is that Wilder had a much darker sensibility. So when you see All About Eve and Sunset Boulevard come out the same year, one, I have no hesitation calling a film noir and the other one, I, I will not call it a film noir. But those are the two best inside show business movies ever made as far as mm -hmm. I'm concerned. Made the same year. It's kind of extraordinary. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. I think uh, I think we're going to wind this one up. Yeah. I uh, I know we had teased people by saying that we were probably going to do one of these at the TCM festival, and you saw me at the festival. Yes, <laughs> I did. <laughs> I, and I was and I was concerned for your well being. You were really exhausted. Uh, it was it was a lot of work, and yeah. uh, we never did. I was already losing my voice at the end of the yeah. first day, so the idea of sitting there and doing like a ninety minute thing with a live audience was like I I don't not only didn't I have the time to do it, I don't know if that I would actually have had the stamina yeah. to do it. It was it was kind of exhausting, but it was. Uh, it was great fun. And to the folks, um, I'm sure you met a lot of people there who watch this. I had a couple of people come up to me and say, introduce themselves and say they watched the show, which is always really exciting to hear. Yes, uh, there were quite a few people I encountered who, like I've never met before. And they, they would say stuff to me like, like just pick up a conversation with me. Oh, well, you know, I don't think this or that. And I'm like, do we know each other? <laughs> and they're like, oh, I watch you and Ann all the time on Ask Eddie. So I was just jumping in to tell you my opinion about this thing you guys <laughs> talked about months ago. And it was like, wow, people are actually watching. It's pretty great. Thank you for watching. We appreciate yes. it. Yes, it's, and, it's absolutely fantastic. And I just want to remind everybody, if you would like to get your question answered in future episodes, uh, just sign up for our uh, free newsletter and uh, you just go to filmnoirfoundation.org and there's a sign up uh, to get our email for free. And then if you'd like to donate $20 or more to the Film Noir Foundation, in addition to signing up, then we do send you our quarterly magazine, the digital version of North City Magazine. Fantastic. Um, so that's it. We should be back on track. Uh, you know, April was insane for me, but I think yeah. uh, we should be back on track uh, doing these on a more regular basis now. Yeah, I think I think May will May is going to be our chance to get back on track because. Yeah, there was two film festivals in April, March. I was sick for three weeks. So yeah. May is going to be our month. I can feel it. Okay, very good. And so <laughs> send in send in those questions. And uh, Anne and I and Emily and Charlotte. And now the tizzy like has her, her legs under her with traveling and flying and hotels and riding in the car and everything. Who knows? She may even put in an appearance. This may be like... The last frontier for her is like yeah. online. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> but thanks again, everybody, for watching and uh, send in the questions. Thank you so much. We'll talk Bye. to you later. Bye.